Good morning. It's great to see all of you here today. And I think, like our last four years, this will be an amazing day. It'll be amazing because we are all together learning. And we represent thousands of educators who are not able to be here today. But I'm really grateful as I look out amongst this room to see all of you. And I hope that when this day ends, you will feel a sense that it was worth it. It was worth it to connect. It was worth it to share. It was worth it to learn. Let me start by saying how excited I am and how thankful I am that this is our fourth year of Unleashing Learning. And I think that it's so important to think about why are we calling this conference Unleashing Learning? The goal was for us to communicate that learning is not in a box. Learning is not rigid and static. Learning opens doors and windows. It's creative, it's energetic, it's fluid, it's flexible. And our role as educators is to create those conditions each and every day for our students. That's why the image of unleashing learning is so important. But you heard me speak, those of you who've been here before, at this conference, and I thought to myself, what is the message I want to share today? And I'll speak a little bit more about this in the keynote, and our chair referred to it. These are challenging times right now. We are all experiencing that. And yet, the focus of my reflections this morning are going to be on each of us who represent all educators who are committed to our students' success and well-being. So I've entitled my reflections today, Mobilizing Brilliance. And I don't say that lightly, because each and every day in classrooms across the Toronto District School Board, our students our staff, our communities experience brilliance. And that's because of you. What does that mean? It means that you know your students. It means that you understand how to create the conditions for them to be successful. It means that you are excited when they succeed. It means that you do everything in your power to make it happen. Is there anything more privileged than the work we get to do? That's why the work that we as educators do for our students is brilliant, and that's the focus that I would like to share today. Very briefly, because you've heard me speak about this before on webinars, on Twitter, when I visit schools, the focus of our work is the multi-year strategic plan that our board passed last year. Very briefly, it speaks to transforming student learning. In other words, are our students at the center, their identity, their experience, their passions and strengths? And are we ensuring that the learning opportunities that we are creating for them are fulfilling our commitment to the global competencies? the critical thinking and creativity, the collaboration and the communication, the character, the citizenship. Don't we need that more than ever? Ensuring that our kids are growing as citizens who can make a difference in this world of ours, which frankly is showing signs of a lot of challenge. Transforming student learning. Secondly, creating a culture of well-being for staff and students. Our census data has been clear that our students are struggling, some of them at least. They've told us that their screen time is growing, that their sense of connection and belonging is decreasing, and their ability to create relationships is starting to become even more challenged. Now, I'm giving you my complete biased opinion. We live in a physical and a digital world. The answer is not to ban things. The answer is to teach our kids how to be healthy in the world we live in now and the world that is to come. 
Third, we know that we have to provide equitable access to the programs and learning opportunities our students need. We know in the Toronto District School Board that right now that's not the case. Our board has made a commitment to really figure out how we do that better. Fourthly, we have finite resources. We have to figure out how to use those resources most strategically. And lastly, it's all based on partnerships and relationships because frankly, I bet you already know this, the world of education is nothing without relationships. It is nothing if we are not connecting with each other and with our students and with our families. It is not capable to do this work without relationships. The vision for learning continues to be our guide. And again, it's been consistently our direction now for going on our fourth year. Shared leadership, enhanced learning community, focused improvement, equity, achievement, well-being. We've taken it a little deeper over the last couple of years, and part of that work is to ensure that our kids are reading by the end of grade one and that they have the math skills required in the early years. We're examining suspensions and expulsions, not because we are running away from safe classrooms in schools, but because we know we can do things differently if we think about who our students are, what they're trying to communicate, and how we can use more restorative practices to make a difference. We're looking at how we provide supports for our students with special education needs, realizing that some of our structures that we presently have are not necessarily the most inclusive structures, but most importantly, who isn't being served in the construct that we're using? And lastly, we continue to be committed to an academic pathway for our students. But an academic pathway doesn't start in grade nine. It starts in kindergarten and probably before. Because it's not as though at grade eight we decide, okay, we have to make a choice now, no. We know that when we're looking at our kindergarten grade one students, they've got to be able to have the basic skills to be successful. We know that when we provide the most inclusive learning environments, kids do better. We know when we figure out how to help our students, especially around well-being, that that concept of suspension and expulsion decreases, and we know we then can be successful in terms of an academic pathway for our students. But let me be clear. And I'll speak about it in a minute, even deeper. But when we're talking about our commitment to equity and anti-oppression and anti-racism, we're really challenging not only the system which has created some of what we see, but we're also asking each and every one of us in the Toronto District School Board to challenge our own bias, to understand barriers that might exist in the community in which we work, to think about our own privilege which means we have to understand our own identity in relationship to those that we serve. I'll speak more about that in a minute. And lastly, we're defining school improvement in a very specific way, but it's owned at the school level. It's not owned at the system level. You know your students. You decide where the focus needs to be. You work collaboratively with your staff to make that happen. You determine what evidence you're gonna collect and you need to communicate how you're doing. That happens at school. That doesn't happen at a system level. The system creates the direction collaboratively. The system aligns the resources explicitly. And then the work of brilliance in classrooms and schools takes over. That's what we mean when we say school improvement. I mentioned previously about the fact that it, in our board, we're really trying to take the conversation around equity, anti-oppression, and anti-racism to a deeper level. Why are we doing that? People have asked me, why are we doing it? And I'm gonna be completely candid. We have collected data on how our students are doing for over 20 years. We're one of the only, actually, we are the only board historically who has done that. A few boards are starting to do it just now. But we have 20 years of data that says that we are not serving some of our students. And unfortunately, when we look at who we are not serving, there are some demographic groups in our community that 
always seem to be at the list, on the list of who we're not serving. Are black students, for example? Indigenous students? So what are we gonna do about that? The trouble is we have the data, the data doesn't change, so we all know when we're talking about doing things differently that we must figure it out. We can't do the same things over and over again or we won't get a different result. And where we're going with that is what I'm sharing about the notion of who am I in relationship to you? How might my experience as a white male not be able to understand your experience? Might I be making assumptions about who you are and what you bring? Yes, because I only have my own experience to draw upon. So what we're trying to interrupt is that very experience of assuming that we know who our students are without creating the space to be changed by them. I really would like to leave that thought because it's an important one. It will be uncomfortable. Because when we use words like racism, people call me and email and ask me to stop. But we can't. Because it's real. And it's here. And it needs to be interrupted. It doesn't mean that we're trying to communicate it in a way that says, Oh my goodness, I'm bad, I'm not good, I'm not doing what my students need. That's not our intention. But our intention is to say, what do we need to interrupt in order for us to provide the conditions our students require? And we're not running away from those experiences that some of our students have, which are really not okay. But the trouble is, we have to create the conditions to understand it and see it, and call it out. Because if my identity doesn't experience it the same way you do, I might not get it unless you challenge me. And when I'm challenged, I have to be able to receive it in a way that's not defensive, or it actually won't move this important work forward. Equity drives our achievement and well-being work. And we know some important things about oppression. We know that it's not, a just, it's not good enough just to have intentions. We actually have to see impact. Our kids need to learn. Our kids need to be well. All kids need to be served. That's not the case yet. We need to understand that the system drives practice and creates culture. And that culture could potentially cause some of the challenges that we're thinking about. It needs to be interrupted. In our work, we understand that there is no such thing as neutral. We all carry bias. It's not neutral. We oftentimes hear about the majority and the minority because we're a democratic society and we vote. And I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be democratic, but I ask the question, what is the experience and the insight and the perspective of those whose vote might be the minority? And how might we need to potentially incorporate that perspective and view into the work we're doing? Because no space is free from oppression, we can't be afraid of it. We have to confront it. And we need to understand that choice is the hallmark of privilege. Not all of us have the same choices because of the bodies that we are in and the experiences that we've had because of the culture we live in and the structures that contain us. I'm asking all of you to hear what I just said as an invitation, not a criticism. An invitation to deeper learning that we can do together that will allow our students well-being and success to be greater. Identity does matter, and we need to keep that in mind. Engagement matters. What do I mean by that? I said earlier that relationships are the foundation of the work we do. Without those relationships, there isn't a sense of belonging. That's my experience. Without voice, 
And think of your own situations, your own history, your own experiences. When you've worked in school communities where your voice is honored, expected, invited, how does that feel? When you're working in a school community where you feel silenced, afraid, unwilling because you're not sure of the reaction, how does that feel? If you're like me, the ability to give voice to whatever is happening in that school community enhances engagement. And that enhanced engagement, I truly believe, percolates through an entire school. It percolates through an entire system. It doesn't happen by accident. So when we use, as one of our multi-year strategic plan pillars, the notion of relationships, please don't see it as something that is simply a poster or a Hallmark card. It's hard to build the kind of positive relationships that bring about the kind of outcomes that we're talking about. But engagement matters. Students, staff, parents and communities, it really, as I think you would believe and understand, matters. So, we have a vision for our students in the Toronto District School Board. Let me offer a few thoughts on what, around what I mean when I say that. The vision we have is that our students are excited to come to school each and every day. Our vision is that we've created conditions that really invite them to question and to think and to wonder and to create. We create those options and opportunities that allow them to do real life work. I visit schools a lot. You might follow me on Twitter and see that everywhere I go I try to put out a reflection. But the one point I want to emphasize this morning is when I see students working on a problem in our community or a problem in our country, or a problem in our world, and they are creating solutions and strategies. They are thinking about different ways to look at the issue. They are working collaboratively to get new ideas. I'm sure all of you in your spaces have experienced it. There is nothing like that kind of energy, that kind of focus, that kind of opportunity. And I'll tell you something I learned about the educators in those spaces. When kids are engaged, no matter what their learning need is, there aren't behavior problems. And teachers are happier. Because who wouldn't want to be in that kind of space? Our vision for our students is that when they graduate, they feel good about who they are. They feel strong in who they are. They feel that they can serve. They can change. They can connect. They can make a difference. That takes a lot of important components that are not always explicitly in the curriculum expectation. You're hearing it from me. We can broaden the expectations to get at this really important kind of vision for students that gets at the heart of who we are as people. Not just what we might learn and get tested on. We want our students to be well. We want our students to thrive. And when they leave us, not only do we expect graduation, but we expect so much more. Doesn't our world need it? The kids in our classes today are the kids who will, whose leadership we will require a very short time down the road. And when I think about the challenges in our world today, in our communities, in our province, I'm wondering, and it takes me to my next point, what is the role of public education to change the world? 95% of the kids in the province of Ontario come to our public schools. Do you see how important our work is? So a vision for public education that I hold is not just that we hold a high standard 
and close the gap. And I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with that. But what happens if we have to shake up the whole paradigm a little bit? What are we measuring? What are we valuing? So when we're holding that bar high and closing that gap, are we doing it in a way that's actually transformative? In other words, does the structure called public education actually help us change the world for a better, for the better? Or might it keep everything moving the same way? Meaning, certain students thrive and get to certain places. Other students don't thrive and struggle. Then we look at who those students are in terms of their cultural, historical, racial, ethnic backgrounds. Do you understand where I'm going here? So shouldn't public education actually push that boundary a bit? Change it? That's what I'm hoping that we talk about unleashing learning and mobilizing brilliance that you're feeling a sense that you have such a significant role to play individually and collectively to create the, the conditions for our students to engage learning in the way we're talking about. Public education is so important. Let me speak very candidly to the challenges that do face us right now. You've just heard me speak, as I hope, with some passion around the importance of public education. And the challenge is that we are facing some pretty significant funding issues that are impacting our staffing issues, which means that, as the chair said, every single school community in the Toronto District School Board is in a state of unease right now because we can't land staffing models yet and we can't determine who's going to be teaching what, and we can't land system positions yet. And I humbly apologize for that, because in my role and in the expectation I have of us, we should be able to do something about that. But unfortunately, we can't move quicker because of the complexities that are in front of us. And I hope that you've heard me, as well as the chair and the board, speak publicly to the significant role all educators play in this important work that I've been discussing and how we need our staff to mobilize the brilliance to unleash the learning that we've been talking about this morning. So we get that in the Toronto District School Board and we will do everything we can to figure out how to get through this together. But I did want you to know that our board did pass budget drivers that will assist us over the next month or six weeks to work through the challenges. And the focus areas are the early years, because we know when we start the right trajectory, it makes a huge difference. We understand the importance of differentiated approaches to support, because not all schools are the same. We understand that student success, in the broadest definition of that term, needs to be the focus. We understand that staff and staffing and professional learning for staff is key. We understand that we need to continue to engage parents, guardians, and students, as I've described. And we also have to think about how to modernize some of our processes, which might take some of our resources away from the students in our schools that we're trying to focus on. So I wanted to mention that to you because I don't have any answers. I know Kevin said we can't ask about anything. I just talked about staffing. And you might ask me a question through Twitter that I won't yet be able to answer because the board and I with the senior team will be working through the months of May and June to finalize the budget. Mobilizing brilliance means that we rely on each and every educator. And I use the word educator broadly inclus with inclusivity because it's about teachers and it's about DECEs, early childhood educators. It's about principals and vice principals. It's about educational assistants. It's about caretakers. It's about office administrators. I'm using the term educator to mean all of us who are connected to the work of serving students in some way 
each and every day. We need to celebrate in the midst of the challenges. And we need to be grateful. I certainly am in the midst of the challenges, the work we do each and every day. That's why I hope that between now and when we leave this afternoon, you feel a sense of inspiration, a sense of renewed energy, a sense of that brilliance that we're speaking about. Because my experience of being at the last three Unleashing Learning sessions is that the voice of educators is what is at the foundation. I'm getting this opportunity now, but frankly, the work that will happen over the next six hours and the marketplace and all the rest, I'm so excited that we're all here to learn and to do the mobilizing because I use the term mobilizing on purpose because there's sometimes this belief that everything is supposed to come from the central office. And I'm here to tell you again, and if you were here last year, you heard it then, and if you were here the year before, you heard it then. I actually don't see it that way. The paradigm has to be flipped. It's not what goes on at a central office that drives things. It's what goes on in your classroom that drives things. And what I truly believe is that real learning is organic. It doesn't just happen because we invite all of us to a big room. It happens because you get excited enough to want to go deeper with a question that you have because of the students you serve. And then you want to find a few other colleagues who might have similar questions so you can go deeper together. And then if those colleagues are not in your building, you might some, find some way virtually or physically to connect with them. It's not just about a learning session that happens uh, on a day, in a month, with a topic that may or may not align with any of the learning questions that you have. Do you see how that paradigm is very different than what we've done over the many, many years? And I'm not criticizing what we've done over the many, many years. I think we've taken it to the furthest place possible. We are effective educators who care about kids and know how to teach. To get to the next place of brilliance, it has to be much more organic. It can't be orchestrated. It's got to be flexible. It's got to be virtual sometimes. It's got to be physically connected sometimes. But you've got to drive that. I hope that you're hearing that sense of ownership that I'm sharing with you. I have to do a little bit of video here. I'd like to just offer a few reflections from our field before I close. Teaching is a stressful job, and it requires sometimes long hours, long days, but when you start to reach out to other folks, be it virtually or face-to-face, -face, you actually begin to enjoy the job more. You really get to challenge yourself to figure out new ways to teach, new ways to engage students, new ways to make students feel successful and safe. I think that dialogue between colleagues in all aspects of teaching is so important. I don't just want to be with experienced teachers or teachers who teach history or secondary teachers for that matter. Collaboration for my teaching practice has been really important, not only for myself in terms of my learning, but also my students and in what I can incorporate into their learning. Board level PD is the best place where I can find uh, teachers of various uh, levels of experience, subject areas, and I think it's good to get outside of your comfort zone. For me, I was able to see the importance of being able to collaborate with an educator, bringing that educator's strength, skills, and her knowledge of students' identities in her classroom combined with, I guess, my knowledge of STEM pedagogy, how we're able to create a learning experience that was engaging for all students. I've seen a difference within my own teaching practice over the last few years. If we go back 10 years ago, I don't think I've seen as much collaboration amongst teachers within the schools, but also outside their schools. So collaborating with their local feeder schools, the elementary teachers, understanding where can we coexist, but also what can we share with each other? What techniques or tricks that 
they're doing in the elementary, can I bring into the secondary science class? And what am I doing in the secondary science class? Can they bring back into their elementary classrooms? I collaborate with other teachers on a number of different levels. So through Google uh, Drive or uh, Google Documents. So I belong to a number of different associations where teachers contribute to a resource bank. With social media, there's such a great network of teachers out there that are on Twitter. And I collaborate with teachers uh, there that I've actually never met. Some of them are across panels, such as elementary, some of them are men. And I think really social media is a positive force that can be used to connect people and allow for collaboration. When we're talking about networking within the use of technology, I think we also need to talk about how we're using the technology. For example, you know, if we're just using it in very surface level ways, where we're just thinking about it in terms of digital literacy as opposed to digital fluency. When we're talking about digital fluency, we're talking about deep learning using technology. So what we do is we want to provide opportunities for students to create new knowledge for themselves. And oftentimes it's hard to find a network of like-minded educators to really help to deepen your understanding and your learning. So the DLL program specifically provides that opportunity of like-minded individuals that have a common vision for what deep learning using technology and what digital fluency looks like in the classroom. Networking and collaboration to transform learning. That was the key message that we got from our really uh, significant voices from our field. Because we do want things to be different and we understand that that can't be the case unless we put ourselves into the discomfort. If you know how to do it, you'll do it. So what is it that we do when we actually don't know how to do it? So let's see what we have to say there. I sometimes feel like you're on an island and you're all by yourself and you don't know what you don't know till you kind of go out there. And so that's one of the ways that I've been trying to find out what I don't know and learn about it. Personally, if I see that my students are not engaged, I know that there's something I don't know and I need to learn. Whenever you have a challenge, I think that's a warning sign that you need uh, to have some professional development. Uh, so that's usually a warning sign for me, that I need to figure out something out, connect with a colleague, attend a PD session, reach out to other folks to be able to get some support. As teachers, it's very important that we continue to grow and learn with the times. By attending sessions, it allows me to gain considerable understanding in a variety of areas. I can bring it back to my school, try it out with my students, and share it with my staff, which is really important to me. I conduct surveys with my students, and I ask my students for feedback. I ask them what I'm doing well, what they appreciate, and what helps them to be successful in the classroom, but I also asked them what I could do better in my own practice, and I asked them that very explicitly. Earlier this month, we went to the Code for Learning on microbits and micro worlds. It wasn't a required course, it, and it's just something that I had never been exposed to before. I think it makes me a better teacher. I think it makes me more balanced in terms of uh, the experiences that I can provide to my students. This past year I took the part one for information uh, technology. What this allowed me to do was to really take a look at the big question, why am I using technology in my classroom? It got me to challenge myself in how is what I'm doing enhanced specifically by using technology. I find it empowering to learn about new strategies based on current research is being used to support student learners. So I attended one that was focused on anti-oppression and equity. In attending those workshops, I was able to bring in powerful discussions and facilitate these discussions with my students around bias, discrimination, stereotypes, but more importantly that they felt that they were being validated based on their own lived experiences and that we all have struggles, but those struggles are very different from one particular community to another. A large part of what I've learned this year is, is global competencies professional learning, and I've been able to bring that uh, back to my students this year in the classroom. And I run an inquiry-based kindergarten program, um, and inquiry is a wonderful opportunity to really embed the global competencies within everything that we do in our classroom. A teacher came to visit my exploration classroom. I was able to get to know this teacher. We conversed about her struggles, her challenges, and we actually devised a solution that she could take with her. The teacher was working in isolation, but then being able to connect with other educators really energized her. And she told me like, as she was leaving that she felt excited to go back to the class to try out some of these ideas. And I was just amazed that 
even small things that I did had a, a really like, impactful effect on her. I really appreciated the comment that we don't know what we don't know. That's why we learn into the community, because someone else might know it. And I want to say that what is exciting about how professional learning is changing in the Toronto District School Board is we're finding that that mobilizing that I talked about is growing and growing. So for example, our digital lead learners, many of you are DLLs. It's continuing to grow because it's owned by you with some conditions of support from the board. We're seeing with our networks for learning, it started in special education, but it's growing. We're again, with a little bit of time and with a little bit of resources, teachers are finding each other across the system to go deeper with a really significant question, as I mentioned before. The hybrid coach model, which is new, is teachers in classrooms that are open for other teachers to come to their classroom and to just learn with. But even if you aren't in any of those groups, your leadership matters because your experience and expertise matters, which means as long as we open up our doors, we're vulnerable about our questions, we're willing to put on the table what we don't know, we can do this together. And our last one, and then I'll be ready to close. This is more about so what for students if we learn this way and if we collaborate. <laughs> I think that the student voice is important to me because we should each have the chance and opportunity to talk and share our views and opinions. The student voice is important to me because of the data, how it shows that our most marginalized students, based off their social identity, their needs are not being met. And we know that in order for their needs to be met, the students need to see themselves in that narrative. And I think as educators, we need to ask ourselves that question of how do students see themselves in their learning environment. Every student has a personal learning profile and they themselves know how best they learn. If they're given the opportunity to voice how they learn best, then teachers will be able to create an activity that will get all the students interested, not just a few. The original assignment was a round table where I had to speak in front of the class. Presenting in front of 30 kids, I was, I was scared to like let my opinion out because I was scared of being judged. I was willing to get a zero instead of doing it, and that's when Ms. Main actually gave me the open space to do a different assignment, and I chose to do a video. The feedback I'm getting from students when I give them choice is that they are more engaged, they're more invested, and they seem to be prouder about the results that they are creating. I felt like I was included in the class. Like, I usually kind of like hide in the back and just kind of come and go kind of thing, but I felt like I was a part of something new, and that was a really good feeling. When I have a choice to do something the way I want to do it, I'll go home and I'll be more passionate about it. Providing opportunities for students to feel a sense of ownership in their learning is so vital for them to feel that they have a say in what is happening, that they can share their own ideas, their own lived experiences uh, within their class community, but also to enhance their own understanding of the world around them. When we include student voice, we really get our students to be in charge of their own learning. I know that student voice is included in my class when I can see that my grade 11, grade 12 math class has become a community of learners. The classroom becomes more sparked more alive. Students are laughing, students are enjoying themselves. By them speaking up about different issues, they're able to uh, think about it, but also challenge themselves and see what their, their, their classmates are also thinking about things as well. The tip I'd give to my fellow teachers is, listen to your students. The students know what they want. Um, once you listen to your students and you deliver what they want, you have an engaged classroom. No matter what classroom I go into, kindergarten, middle grades, high school, where we've created conditions for students to tell us who they are, what inspires them, 
how they learn. And I get it. When we're talking to a five-year-old, it might be different than when we're talking to a 14 or an 18-year-old. But I ask that if all 1,500 of us in this room do something explicit, if you haven't done it already, and I'm probably trusting that you have, to create the kind of condition to get that kind of voice to influence the learning, please continue to do that. Please continue to inspire your colleagues to do that. Because what we know is that we can make a difference for all students, most importantly those who we aren't serving as well now, if we truly create an opportunity to hear them and to act upon what they share. In closing, we can do this work when we have the leadership conditions, the culture in every school that truly inspires us, challenges us, and celebrates success. That, again, doesn't happen by accident. It's not just the principal's job. It's all of our job to be sure that we are creating that kind of learning environment. Leadership is key to bring about change. We're not perfect, but we are so committed to this vision, to how we do this work together. I use the term often, patient urgency. We have to be patient because learning takes time. But we have to be urgent because we can't let one student fall through the cracks. So how do we learn, which takes time, but deal with the urgency that all students deserve to be successful? And my closing thought, we've got this, as long as we work together. Thank you so much for your attention. I think we're going to do some questions now. Thank you so very much. So we have a few questions. Um, the first one is, the topic is academic pathways at elementary. So what does this look like tangibly in an elementary school or classroom, and what can I do as one elementary teacher? Thank you. All of us can make a difference individually. However, I will say that we also have to work collectively. If you are a kindergarten grade one, two teacher, how our students have those really significant foundational skills, oral language development that supports early literacy and math. We know when that foundation is provided with really effective programming, it starts students in an amazing way. When I speak about how we think about students with special needs, we also have to understand that each student is unique. So structurally, we sometimes may, and I know this is changing all across the system, move students to special education classrooms or programs. Schools that have moved away from that model are starting to see tremendous success in terms of our students' outcomes. And lastly, we will have students whose learning needs are great and might need that very specialized programming, but we're very precise in terms of when we make that decision. So no matter where you teach, we can create a different kind of pathway. Because what we're trying to change is a pathway that we see throughout. A student who struggles to read by the end of grade one, who is invited to a special education class or program. We look at who is in that particular program, not all but some, and then we look at suspension rates by grade six. We then look at most of the time it's applied or locally developed that the student is expected to go into in high school, and we look at the graduation rate that happens after. Do you see that pathway right from age four? We're interrupting that. The Toronto District School Board has one of the smallest numbers of students in the applied programming across the whole province, and our success rate for those students continues to grow. So my last comment is, no matter where you teach, we have to think about our attitudes. What do we really believe about students and their learning, and do we believe that our students can be successful with the right conditions? Next question is similar, but more holistic, I think. 
So challenging streaming and promoting inclusion is a critical aspect of transforming student learning. How do you see school and staff members district-wide working together to move this forward? I would say that that is the only way to do this work because it's messy work. It's not as though there's some roadmap to follow that every student will actually be successful just because we follow it. It's this precise as far as I'm concerned. You know the students in your classroom. You know who you're meeting their needs and you know who you're not meeting their needs. You know it. So can you take those students whose needs or whose struggles or whose challenges are a bit beyond you, can you take that experience to other colleagues in your school and say, what do you think? Help me think through this. What have you tried? And I truly believe that is the only way we can be transformative. People sometimes think that transformative happens in big spaces like this. The purpose of big spaces like this is just to get our minds thinking differently, possibly a few new ideas that we can bring back. But where the real work happens is each and every one of us being vulnerable enough to bring the questions that we have and be trusting of our colleagues that together we could figure this out, no matter how significant the need. And we don't always need an expert from somewhere else. I worry about that. Expertise is in each and every school. How do we enhance it, strengthen it, grow it? It's not just about a knowledgeable other coming from some other place. Sometimes we need that just to jumpstart us, but we shouldn't sell our own capabilities short, thinking that it's always required that someone else needs to help us. Can we make collaboration across panels a priority so that we can more holistically support students and more intentionally work together? I came to Toronto District School Board three and a half years ago, and I'd been in a couple of different places, and I learned that when we talk about culture and systems, the fact that we have so many configuration of schools, K to 8, K to 5, K to 6, 7 to 8, 9 to 12, the trouble with that is if we're not seeing ourselves as one system, if we do not have structures and processes that allow us to talk to each other beyond school buildings, our kids might actually feel like they're going to different worlds as they move from one place to another. And I get so nervous when I hear, I've got to prepare my kids for the next place. What is that all about? We have to pay attention, and we are, to creating process and structures that allow us to go beyond any one building. Professional learning in your school is important, but professional learning between our schools is also important, and we're going to figure that out. As I close, I want to say one last thing. I'm going back to my opening statement about what I entitled these reflections. Mobilizing brilliance. I mean it sincerely. I get to experience it daily, and I will call it out now. You are here because you care, you're interested in learning, you're leaders, you're obviously inspired educators, and you're giving your time to learn, and I trust that you will share when you go back. Thank you. You are an example of brilliance. All the best.